What should we talk about this morning? What's on your mind? We hope nothing. Well, <laughs> yeah, and if nothing's on anybody's mind, then yeah, there's nothing else for us to do or to worry about. <laughs> But I suspect that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, yes? Um, last weekend I asked you if uh, you could tell me how many levels existed after the nine levels that take you to, uh, to starting the passing. And you said 16. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay, well, I, I'll just briefly summarize. You know, the, in, in the practice traditions, uh, uh, and they they come from different sources. So okay, now there's the sanata and the vipassana components, and so the, 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 the it's been recognized that there's different stages that a, a person goes through. You know? Okay, so first of all. In the Samatha practice tradition, well, the Buddha basically described Samatha in terms of, of 12 verses in, uh, in the Anapanasati Sutta. And then uh, uh, about a millennium later, Kamala Shila uh, refined those uh, descriptively, although still very still into nine very short, compact stages, but they actually were delineated more clearly in terms of the stages of development. Okay, and then when a person has developed a sufficient degree of concentration, they could take up the jhanas or jhanas from the, from the suttas, of which there are, uh, in most of the sutras, is described as being eight, which are four uh, jhanas with form, and then there are four, there, there are really four uh, further refinements of the fourth jhana, but they're sometimes referred to as the four formless jhanas. Okay. So that makes a total of eight. But in some places, the jhanas are described uh, in terms of a sequence of nine states. And the ninth state is the stage of cessation of perception and feeling, or vedna, meaning effective quality, and perception, meaning the process by which the mind conceptually identifies what it is uh, observing. And this last one, the cessation of naroda, the Samapadi is in uh, the commentarial tradition said to be identical to the uh, Nirvana, Pari Nirvana that's experienced uh, when an enlightened being's body dies. So this, these are all the numbers that go along with the Samatha tradition. Now, uh, in the sutras, in terms of the uh, path that includes the Samatha tradition and concludes with awakening. Uh, the Buddha described this as being seven stages of purification that he compared to a, a chariot relay of, of seven. As a matter of fact, the sutra is called the, the relay, chariot relay sutra. And these, these seven, again, are purification of virtue uh, and then there's purification of uh, mind or consciousness, which essentially includes, uh, it, it is, as it has been interpreted, it includes uh, all the stages of samatha and the stages of the jhana. And then, and then it commences to describe in detail the stages of uh, the next five purifications. So the purification of virtue and purification of, of consciousness were the first two of those seven. So the next five are usually interpreted as specifically referring to the 
insights that lead to awakening. And so those are purification of view, followed by purification by overcoming doubt. The next one is called the purification by knowledge of what is and is not the path. And then this is followed by purification by knowledge and vision of the way. Uh, and the final stage is called the purification by knowledge and vision, where the actual awakening uh, occurs and uh, likewise a reflection on the uh, recognition of the fetters that have been overcome and the uh, ability to, uh, to at will enter into the state of fruition consciousness of palasamapati, which is the, uh, the experience of emptiness uh, or nirvana, depending on you know, how you like to describe it, same thing. So from the sutras, we have these seven purifications, which encompass the, uh, the, the nine stages of samatha and the nine jhanas. And in the latter stages, these are divided up, starting with the purification of view. Uh, these were uh, likewise uh, about a million millennium later, not quite anymore, about 800 years later. There was a Theravadan commentarialist uh, named Buddha Gosa. As a matter of fact, most of modern Theravada is based on his commentaries. And he divided he subdivided these last five knowledges, uh, last five purification, into a series of knowledges, uh, which, uh, depending on how you read them, uh, is roughly about 16. And in the modern tradition, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw has very clearly defined the, those 16 knowledges that make up the, the sequence from purification and view through the uh, purification, uh, or through actually uh, the uh, fruition samapati and the reflection on the disappearance of the fetters. So that's how the whole thing fits together. Did I paint a clear picture? Did it make sense to you? Okay. Uh, and I could, could go through the knowledges one at a time, and I'd be happy to if you like. But let me just transpose this and see if we can do some cross-correlation with the later Mahayana uh, descriptions. Uh, the two basic Mahayana descriptions, which don't really fit together very well, but often get, they get kind of squished together, you know, as, as, as if they fit. And uh, one is the, the five paths, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And the other is the Bodhisattva Bhumis, which depending on which source you go to, there's different numbers of uh, uh, 8 or 10 or 12 or 16 and so forth. I think 10 is the most common to observe breakdown of those Bhumis. So, anyway, in terms of the five paths, there is um, there is the uh, uh, Trying to, you, you can help me with the. Uh, hello. Uh, you can help me with the five path descriptions if you're, uh, you know, uh, if you if you like. You probably are more familiar with them even than, than I am anyway. So, but anyway, where we find the development of vipassana is in the second of the five paths, and this is this is where person would be doing uh, analytical investigation of emptiness. And either at the same time, or before, or after, they would be following the nine stages that were described by Kamala Shila, or the development of Samatha. So it is in the second path that it eventually culminates in the uh, union of uh, samatha and vipassana. Now, if we go back to the uh, to the sutra system, the in the in the according to the original sutras, uh, 
and the way they've been interpreted. The union of Sanatana with Pasana occurs in the purification of not by knowledge and vision of the way. So the practitioner already has Samatha at this stage has had profound insight into impermanence, emptiness, and, and suffering. And so it's actually the uh, in both the second path of the five paths and in the final stage of the purification by knowledge and vision of the way, both are exactly the same that there comes about a union of Sanatha and Vipassana, in which, uh, which leads to the, uh, which leads to the awakening. Now, which in the, in the seven purifications would be the initiation uh, by, of purification by knowledge and vision, and of course, in the five path system corresponds to the path of seeing. Okay. Now, in the, in the seven purification system, this last purification repeats a number of times, uh, typically four, by which a person advances through four different stages or degrees of awakening, the screen enter, once returner, non-returner, and, uh, and arahat, or Buddha. And in the five-path system, exactly the same process is taking place in uh, what's uh, in the Don Lam, the path uh, 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 of the habituation. So what happens is a person is continuing their advancement to uh, greater and greater degrees of enlightenment. Uh, Buddhahood, or Arhatship, corresponds in the five path system to the fifth path, which is called No More Learning. So that's how these fit together. The bodhisattva boomies are a little bit harder to, you know, depending on whose system you follow to integrate into those. But in in some systems, uh, they would say that uh, the uh, that the first bodhisattva boomi corresponds to the path of seeing, which would correspond to the beginning of the purification by knowledge and vision of the way. And the moment of consciousness that that occurs in would be called Dasana Marga or Marga Pala, depending on whether you're following the Pali in the Sanskrit traditions. Uh, but as I say, there's some unclarity about how the, uh, the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Bhumi system is applied. Because on um, some, in, in some views, the, uh, the first stage of awakening, the stream entry, occurs at the third bodhisattva boom, and the first two bodhisattva boomies uh, correspond to uh, the events that in the seven purifications that are called uh, purification by knowledge and vision of the way. The seventh is purification by knowledge and vision. But knowledge and vision of the way. And this is, this is where insights have been attained, but they have not yet matured into full awakening. So there is understanding, uh, at, even at a more profound intuitive level, of impermanence and emptiness and suffering. But this has not led to the uh, to direct experience of nirvana or, or empty. So these are the different systems that, as a matter of fact, there's more than that, especially in the Mahayana, because each different school in each different country in each different period of time has made their own version of it. So, but that's more or less how all of these things fit together. So what was it you were trying to sort out in your own mind? The the vipassana, the insight. Okay. Well, I think that sort of setting aside all these traditional systems, I mean, making use of them, draw upon, drawing upon them as uh, as resources for understanding. But let's just talk 
and let's just talk about how insight is achieved, uh, what that, what the nature of that insight is, of the, of the important insight, and how that culminates in the awakening. So, I think that I think the most important thing that is necessary before insight can occur is, uh, it's interesting, it's uh, like so many things in, in the Buddha Dhamma, we look at it and the beginning and the end are the same thing, they're, they're, but they're different degrees of the same thing. The beginning of any path of insight is a change in the way a person regards themselves and reality. And of course, the, the, the final stage, the culmination of insight, is that same thing, but at a much deeper level. But the first is, uh, which you can understand through intellectual reflection, that uh, although I think of myself as, a, as a, an entity, a being, living in a universe made up of many other separate and discrete entities with which I interact, if I reflect, I realize that that is all an inference, a kind of storytelling by the mind, because what my entire existence has consisted of is a series of experiences. The Buddha the, Buddhist, the core of the Buddhist teaching, right from the beginning, is to point out that being and experience are identical. And that all the descriptions of being, in any other terms, are just, just so stories that the mind makes up. Because what your entire life has consisted of is a sequence of experiences. And what those experiences consist of is consciousness and whatever is being taken as the object of consciousness in that experience, in that moment. So the beginning of insight, is, and this can come spontaneously if you sit down and just meditate for long enough and you're watching your breath and you're watching this and you're watching that, you know, eventually it'll dawn on you that, well, you know, uh, all, all that's happening here is one object, I'm, I'm conscious of this object, and then it passes away, and something else rises up, and then it passes away, and something else rises up, and then you notice that, yeah, and they're connected with each other, you know. The sensation of the fly landing on my forehead triggers the next object of consciousness, which is the perception of a fly, which is followed by the next object of consciousness, which is the feeling of annoyance, which is followed by the next object of consciousness, which is the urge to brush it away, and then if you actually perform an action, the, the object of consciousness is an intention, and then the next thing that follows is not any self doing anything, but rather sensations that correspond to the body carrying out the, the uh, action. So one approach to Vipassana is just tell somebody to sit down long enough until eventually they start to figure this out. But the shortcut is to just know in the beginning that, you know, if you reflect that your life is a series of experiences that they're causally connected to each other. There's both an immediate causality, one moment to the next, but also there is a longer term causality that how you may react in this moment uh, may be determined by experiences that you have in and sometime in the past, last week, last year, when you were two years old, who knows. But as a matter of fact, uh, when you reflect even more, you realize that all of these experiences in the past, in some degree or another, are influencing the experiences that you have in the present moment. And the reaction of your mind to the present experiences is the stuff out of which, together with the past, that it will become a part of the whole thing that determines what your experiences in the future will be. So, at that point, you have attained the purification of view. You've attained the right view that allows you to begin to penetrate more deeply in terms of the cultivation of insight. 
So usually, traditionally, it's said that that the that the insights that you're after are uh, the insight into the three characteristics. That all phenomena, which you have to understand, phenomena in uh, in Buddha Dhamma uh, is uh, are, are these mental events that by which you experience things, whether it's the idea of something that you think exists or whether it's a sensory experience, you know, all of these are phenomena. And that the characteristic of all phenomena is that they are impermanent and that they are empty. As you said in Meditate, once you have the right view, you begin to realize that uh, well, for example, you'll notice that sensations just come and go in a constant flux, and that there is there is no permanent entity in those sensations. That all uh, qualities of thingness, of uh, where there seems to be uh, some sort of temporal, temporally enduring substance or thing or object that is identified and associated with particular qualities, that this is all something that is actually projected by the mind to explain the sequence of sensations that are taking place. And of course, your mind does a beautiful job of creating a coherent explanation based on all of your past experience. And so at some point, you will realize that everything is impermanent and that everything is mind created. That whatever the source is of the sensations that you experience, that your mind, out of those sensations, manufactures a reality. And then this insight, when you carry it over into all the rest of your experiences, you, you realize that that's why Different people experience different things in completely different ways. Every one of us, every person is doing the same thing that I'm doing. Their mind is creating a reality to account for sensation. At the level of, at the most basic level, all of our minds are very similar, so all of our minds construct things that are very similar. Um, so, in terms of the most fundamental, characteristics by which we describe our projected external world, which is actually an internal world, there's a lot of conventional reality. Because we can talk about an object like this, and we can agree on all kinds of its characteristics. And we can compare our experiences. But reality, of course, is far more elaborate than the description of individual objects that we encounter. And as soon as we move to slightly more complex level of reality, we, we, we discover we're outside of the realm of conventional reality. There is no conventional reality at the level of, of uh, uh, values and judgments that we all, we all have different values and judgments. So, you know, uh, part of our experience of our conventional reality includes those things that are not shared. And so we begin to, when, when we become aware of that, to be aware of that, we realize that things are, uh, not, not only is our mind concocting the view of the universe, if we stick to just simple objects and the fact that we all see them in the same way, we might think that, yes, but <clears throat> our mind must be doing a really good job of producing a very accurate version of what, what's out there. And so therefore, there must be an out there that corresponds to my vision in here. But when we look at it beyond just the most very simple level, we discover that that's not true, that everyone is living in a different world, a different reality. The same thing happens to two people, and it's experienced in a very different way. And so we discover that it is, it is empty. Um, the discovery of impermanence is not that there are enduring things that uh, come into existence, last a little while, and then disappear. It is that 
everything is in flux. If we begin to examine our minds, I mean, first we notice that all sensations are constantly changing. And you observe the sensation of your breath, or the rise and fall of your abdomen, or anything. And you see that all sensations are continually in flux. And the closest there is to any thingness system in, in them is that there are certain patterns that your mind is capable of recognizing that recur. But otherwise, sensation, the realm of form, is nothing but flux. And then when we begin to reflect introspectively and we watch our mind, as our mind is constantly generating interpretive reality, interpretation of reality, we see the same thing, that these, these mental objects that, that account for everything, the same thing, that they are continuously changing. If we turn this from the external world to the examination of the self, and we look for the self that we think we are. The self that we think we are, uh, well, there's that sense that it's permanent. It's been around as long as I can remember, and uh, I expect it to continue being there. So I have a sense of the self that has permanent. And uh, I also uh, think of this self that I have or that I am as being um, separate and distinct, independent. That myself, the one, the one thing that's really clear is that whatever myself is, it is separate and distinct from those things that are, are not self, um, that very much defines the way it is, the separateness. And the other thing is that the self is unitary, that there is just one of me. And in terms of the permanence, it's always been the same one of me. So if we examine our sense of self, we find that. And then we say to ourselves, well, okay, this is the self that I believe that I am and that I feel like I am, you know. And what is its function? Well, the self is the experiencer and the self is the doer. So in the next stage of insight, you see, it's it's easier to see, it's easy comparatively to see that the world is actually empty in the sense that it does not have a nature from its own side, a self-existent nature of being the way our mind projects it to be. That we can see. And if we practice a lot, then we can see it more and more often. But it's, it is magnitudes of difficulty more difficult to get past this feeling that we are a permanent, unitary, and separate self that is the experiencer of all of these things and is the decision maker and intender and initiator of our activity. So this this is the really difficult one for us to work on. But when we examine, if we just simply observe what's taking place in our mind, moment to moment, while meditating and while not meditating. And of course, we can supplement this with various kinds of, of analysis. But if through analysis and observation, we go in search of the permanent, separate, and unchanging, uh, and uh, uh, permanent, separate, and uh, unitary self, everywhere we look, it's not there because we find that the description of self we come up with is constantly changing. That we are a different self at different times, in different circumstances, and, uh, you know, at best, whatever it is, you know, the, the, these five aggregates is constantly modifying and change, being changed both by things external to it and by things internal to it. And so, uh, what you do discover is that there is a continuity. Indeed, in the sequence of experiences that makes us up, there is, con there is causal continuity. But we find that the aspect of permanence dissolves and disappears, and there is only uh, causal or karmic continuity to the self. Uh, as we go into it more deeply, one of the things that we'll discover through direct observation is that 
there is no experiencer. That when we look, we'll see there are all those instances where we are seeing, but there's no seer. We're thinking, but there's no thinker. We're hearing, but there's no hearer. And we'll notice that the hearer, that the self, the idea of who we are, is actually a separate mental object that arises independently of the seeing and the thinking and is taken as an object. And then our mind creates a story that, this, that, that makes this self into the hearer, the seer, and the thinker. And so it's very important when we discover that. Likewise, when we examine carefully, we look at the arising of intentions, and we see that the intentions arise from a seemingly from nowhere. This intention, intention arises. And of course, we look at that, and we find that the source of that intention is in that it caused that chain of causality that leads to the present experience. And the interpretation of the present experience on the basis of the past gives rise to an intention. What happens then is the sense of self arises and appropriates the intention and says, and says, well, this happened to me, I feel this way about it, so I'm going to do such and such about it. And you can see that happening. And when you see that happening and you see that the self is just another mental object, another mental projection, that is not always there, it's only sometimes there, it's generated at certain times, then all of a sudden you have really deep insight into the emptiness of the self. The other insight that needs to come with these is recognizing that uh, in a world of emptiness occupied by uh, nothing but a mind-projected self, the self is empty and the world is empty, that if the mind clings to anything, it's going to be like clinging to uh, uh, clinging to a, a branch covered with razor blades or clinging to a burning firebrand. It only, can only cause pain. And that all of these desires and fears and hopes and intentions that are based around a self that doesn't really have a substantial existence of its own, likewise, can only lead to disappointment, frustration, and to, and to pain and suffering. So this is, in the process, progress of insight, you come to recognize the impermanence, both of form and of, of nama, of mental object. You come to recognize the emptiness of the apparent external reality and of the self, and you come to realize the inevitability of suffering if you have a mind that grasps and clings to these things and generates desire and aversion out of that. Now, insight comes in different at different levels. This is profound insight. You can understand this intellectually and very clearly. The second level is that you can, by repeatedly bringing yourself into awareness of this and applying your intellectual understanding over and over again to your experience, then this begins to change your intuitive view of reality. So that now it's not just an intellectual thing, but you intuitively recognize the emptiness of things and the emptiness of self. But there is still, nevertheless, there is still this working of the mind that still believes in the self even though it sees that things are empty, both intellectually and intuitively, and generates emotions and emotional reactions from that very deep place, uh, including desire and aversion, other manifestations of craving. So the, the culmination of insight is when you have a direct experience of one kind or another that basically penetrates to this deepest level and it eradicates the attachment to the self-view and eradicates the attachment to the view of things as being self-existent. And that that is the primary fetter that is eliminated when a person achieves awakening. So in terms of any of these paths, we're going to go through the same process through 
a combination of analysis and observation, we are going to refine our view, and then we're going to refine our understanding of the three characteristics. And then we are going to apply that until we bring the mind to a place that it can undergo this profound change and transformation. It seems that it's interesting, there seems to be a number of ways that it, that, that can occur. And um, the one, what you might call the famous one, the one that most people have heard about and believe to be the way, is where you have a particular moment, a Magapala moment or a Dasana Marga moment. And the essential nature of that is you've come to understand the, 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 these insights have become so strongly developed in your mind. And partly as a result of the insights and partly as a result of meditation practice, you have developed very powerful equanimity. So because of this equanimity, craving doesn't arise. An object arises, it's seen in terms of these three characteristics. And it is not reacted to by craving and grasping. So what happens is for a moment, the mind's fabricating activities, the projecting activities that create the illusion that we always see, that stops. And all it has to do is stop for a moment and it reveals to the mind, it, it reveals the nature of what's been going on. It dispels the the uh, enchantment that the mind has been under because the mind has continuously been generating these images, these views. And when they stop, then the mind realizes that its projections are not ultimate reality. And so ignorance is overcome. So this is the one where this, this is the dramatic awakening. This is the one that tends to be followed by, by bliss and you gotta jump up and go tell your meditation teacher and describe what happened and, you know, all this sort of thing. It's not the only way that it happens, so. Um, and the circumstances under which it, it, it happens can vary, but it seems also that a person's insight can keep on, well, there, actually there's another way that, that this kind of profound insight can happen. It has to do with the description of the links of dependent origination. The most essential part of dependent origination, and if you make that a part of your insight practice, and you see, and you, same way analytically and experientially, you see the truth of it, what the links of dependent origination say is that when there is a conscious being with sense organs, there will be contact of an object with those sense organs. It gives you rise to a feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Whenever that feeling arises, it will trigger craving, desire for that which is pleasant and aversion towards that which is unpleasant. Or even in the case of something neutral, it may arise a desire to pursue something that is pleasant in place of it. That desire, that craving, is what leads the mind to make its provisional projections into a reality. And when that happens in that moment, the person becomes a self filled with craving related to some object or objects. You know, it, the, that craving leads to becoming. You uh, become not being, but becoming, because you are, uh, you are not a self who is being, you are a self who is craving some different state in relationship to these objects that you see as real. And sometimes the awakening, the, the Magapala, the Sana Marga, comes as a result not of the cessation of fabrications, but of clearly seeing this process unfold. One object after another, there, there is the, uh, the sensation, the feeling, the craving, the attachment, and the becoming, uh, leading to a new sensation, feeling, uh, craving attack. And there will happen over a short period of time, each successive object that arises in the mind will be 
uh, crystal clear in how this process is happening. And so the mind will just abruptly stop at the point of craving and recognize that it need not continue to, to do this. And so it's a very similar sort of sudden understanding. But the other ways that this seems that this can happen, which uh, I found very interesting, I, I started uh, some, oh, some few years ago collecting stories of enlightenment, both from, from people's personal experiences and from things that were published. And there were a remarkable number of cases where people never had a Magha Pala and Dasana Magha type moment. They didn't have a sudden awakening. And then you go back and you look at the sutras and the description there in the time of the Buddha. And you have people are doing all kinds of things. You know, they're eating meals, they're having conversations, they're listening to Dharma talks, they're uh, fanning the Buddha, they, you know, all kinds of situations. Uh, they're not sitting in meditation. And some of these could be interpreted as happening in a brief period of time. But some of them you look at and it's like, you know, uh, they could be talking about all day or all, you know, or, or several hours or days or weeks o over a period of time that they're awakening matures. And having read modern stories of uh, this and talked to some people, I've realized that sometimes what seems to happen is that if the practice of developing intuitive insight if you understand emptiness, selflessness, and impermanence, and suffering, if you understand them well enough, and you practice being aware of them over and over again in your life experience, they, that shift, that transformation in the way that your mind sees will come about. And instead of happening in a moment of sudden transition, it may creep up gradually, or it may happen over a period of a few hours when something triggers the, the gelling together of this understanding. And, uh, and I've, I've noticed that there's a number of other modern meditation teachers and Dharma teachers that are, uh, have been finding the same thing and describe it. And some of the, uh, I, maybe my friend Michelle has heard from some of the spirit rock teachers who poo-poo uh, the Magapala thing as not being such an important uh, thing. Uh, so there are other ways that this can come about. But if you look at what, what I'd really like to bring your attention to, just to kind of sum all of this up. If you look, whether you look at the seven purifications or the 16 knowledges or the uh, five paths, in particular the second the third path, uh, whether you look at these different systems, that when you understand them, they're all about the same thing. They're shifting away from the way that we normally see things to a more fundamentally, experientially, phenomenologically accurate view. And once we do that, it opens us up to understanding that each moment of experience consists of consciousness and objects of consciousness, which allows us to see and understand the emptiness of things, then that can also lead to understanding the emptiness of self. And then when we understand those, we can recognize the danger that exists in cleaning and craving. And so we can cultivate this more accurate and, genu and genuine understanding. Any questions about that? Very concise description that you don't know if I lost half of you or all of you or confused you along the way. But hey, please say something. <laughs> makes perfect sense. What's that? It makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, yes, it, it, it does. It does. You mean what she said? She said it makes perfect sense. And that's the thing. And that's why, you know, for years I've been frustrated by, you'll, you'll read 
about the Bhama. And when you get to the most important parts of it, it turns into baffle gab that you can't figure out. It doesn't make sense, you know. <laughs> so, it, it does make sense. Another uh, little question. You, you outlined a, a discrete number of steps in different traditions, and it seems like some of those steps in certain circumstances can be bypassed or like jump to the head of the line and say, so okay. Depending and on the practice, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, so I'll repeat the question. She's, so uh, the question was that I had described uh, a sequence of steps in different systems of practice, uh, and uh, that what you said is it seems that some of these steps uh, well, there's, very, there's differences in these descriptions, and they don't all include all the same steps, which suggests that some of these steps can be bypassed in different systems. And that, that is true. Depending on the system of practice that you're following, you won't necessarily uh, experience all of exactly the same things. Now, what you do, well, a very good example of this, one that is worth mentioning, the Buddha, it, uh, well, if, if we look at the sutras, one of the sutras teaches us uh, that whenever somebody is awakened, that seemed to happen in one of the following ways. Either they attained samatha, and, and, and samatha corresponds to the, uh, the stage beyond the ninth stage in Kamala Shiva's rendering. Uh, and, so first you achieve samatha, and then you a attain insights, uh, following which you achieve awakening. Secondly, is uh, that a yogi may first attain insight, following which samatha is cultivated, and in that way achieve awakening. Or samatha uh, and insight may be attained yoked together in some way, and there's various ways they could be yoked together. But they are attained together, yoked together, leading to awakening. And if we refer to these three possible approaches, we'll see, we'll be able to understand a lot of the differences in the sequences that happen. In particular, whenever vipassana is developed before samatha, there are some difficult, painful stages that uh, a person goes through. So, for example, in the second path, when it is practiced by somebody who is first cultivating the uh, analytical uh, meditation on emptiness, prior to developing samatha, they go through a very uh, unpleasant state that is where uh, they experience a lot of discomfort, suffering, things like that. Likewise, in the Theravada tradition, with the 16 knowledges, in the middle part of the purification by knowledge and vision of the way, the yogi who has, is doing a, what's called a dry insight practice and has not yet developed samatha will go through a series of knowledges that are known as the dukkha jnanas. Jnana means knowledge and dukkha means suffering. So they're the, they're the suffering knowledges. And they give, they're given the most descriptive names possible, the knowledge, knowledge of fear, knowledge of misery, and knowledge of disgust. <laughs> and so this is a reflection of the vipassana before samatha approach. The reason being that when you have samatha, you have profound tranquility and equanimity. You already have a lot of equanimity in place, and you have a mind that is in a state of joy. Joy is a mind that is predisposed to, to see things in a positive light. When you do dry insight, or when you do the analytical meditation on emptiness, it leads you to a situation where you have, intellectually, 
and uh, you have intellectually this understanding that, wow, things really are empty, and the self that I cling to is an illusion. But at the deepest level, you're still firmly believing in the self. So uh, what you have is a self that has no solid ground to stand on, a self that is living in a world of hurt with no way out. So the intellectual mind has opened Pandora's box. The gut level emotional mind says, oh, this is happening to me that I am condemned to be in this horrible state. Right? So when you're still attached to self and you see and, and you intellectually understand reality, it can be very disturbing, very painful. If in your meditation practice you've seen the fleetingness of everything, the impermanence, and if you realize that to try to grasp to any of that can only cause you harm, and there is no ground to stand on, then, then a feeling of, of fear arises. And then when you realize that this is all there is, this is no way, there is no way out, you know, then it turns to misery and disgust. And this can, and I think this stage, I, I think in both the second path of the five path system and in the Dukkanyanas of the uh, 16 knowledge system, they use the same terminology to describe the danger that a yogi is in. And that's thought that this is called the rolling up the mat stage. The yogi can, because this is so terrible, abandon the practice, roll up the mat, and the typical thing they do is they leave the retreat, uh, go to a bar, try to you know try to lose themselves in sensory uh, distractions to the greatest possible degree, and it's a very unfortunate thing. If they stay with the practice, you know if. If the yogi in either of these traditions stays with the practice, then they'll come to the point where the emotional mind will become exhausted in its misery and its disgust. And the and and you know it's like uh, if you well you know what it's like when you reach the point of emotional exhaustion. In a way, it it gives you it finally gives you some peace and a little bit of clarity. And it's in that clarity that, that the person can make the resolve that, okay, the only way out of this is to have refuge in the Buddha's enlightenment. That indeed, this teaching is real. Indeed, there is something at the end of the path. And therefore, I'll go back, I'll re-enter the fray. I will resubmit myself to, uh, to the practice until I achieve the goal and the fruit. So, so now if a, if a yogi has developed really strong samatha, then this is a tremendous buffer to, to being able to confront these insights with equanimity, uh, with tranquility. And a mind in a state of joy even when it sees the unpleasant, doesn't see it as being so unpleasant. And so it's much easier to pass through that. The one other path and approach that is beneficial is the more that a person can loosen their attachment to the view of self, because it is the attachment to the personality view that is really responsible for its suffering your mind generates the emotion of suffering when, you know, it, the computer processes the information and the result that is generated is bad news, we better suffer, and so suffering is turned on. And the bad news in this case is the attachment to the personality view. So that the more the person can overcome their attachment to personality view, uh, weaken that attachment before the full brunt of these insights hits them, then the less the less disturbing it's going to be for them. Now if that's done in combination with samatha, 
then, uh, then it's pretty easy, it's pretty clear sailing. In all of these, in all of these methods, though, and I mentioned this earlier, there is the union of samatha and insight that is necessary to reach the awakening. Because you need the equanimity of the samatha and you need the equanimity of the insight together to have enough equanimity that craving ceases. Equanimity is the opposite of craving. You can say equanimity is the absence of craving. Equanimity is non-reactivity, non-grasping the pleasant, non uh, uh, trying to avoid the unpleasant. When the pleasant and the unpleasant and the neutral are all confronted with just exactly the same non-reactivity that is equanimity. In other words, there is no craving. So you need the combined equanimity of both insight and samatha. Typically, in these systematic practices, you need the combined insight of both uh, to give you the uh, ability to step out of craving. When the cessation of craving occurs, what is revealed is, is nirvana. Nirvana is the cessation of craving. Uh, well, the cause of nirvana is the cessation of craving. When craving is gone, nirvana can be experienced. And it can, it can be, in a sense, the object of consciousness for a period of time. More questions? Yeah. Did you just say nirvana can be the object of consciousness? Uh, or the yes. lack of craving? Uh, well, yeah, you said, did I, did, the question was, did I say nirvana could be the object of consciousness or the lack of craving. Okay, the lack of something cannot be an object of consciousness. When we say nirvana is a cessation of craving, what we really mean is that that when there is a cessation of craving, then nirvana is revealed. Okay? And when we say that nirvana is the object of consciousness, well, not in the it's not an object of consciousness in the usual sense, but uh, it is in most of these systems, uh, except for uh, well, there, there are certain dry insight practices where a person's experience is actually described as a as a lapse in consciousness or a forgetting. Most of the time, it's a conscious experience. But what becomes known to the mind is nirvana or emptiness or ultimate reality. So it is, uh, it is described in the Theravadan tradition as, in, as being an object of consciousness. Uh, but it's more that there is an experience of consciousness, and consciousness has no other object and therefore nirvana is realized. That might be a better way, a little, little luckier and more cumbersome. But essentially what happens, what we're talking about, ultimate reality, emptiness, and nirvana are the same thing. They are that which is unborn, unconditioned, and unceasing. In other words, that which involves no projected, no mental projection, no object of, of any kind. So the, the ultimate reality, um, therefore, is not an object in, in any sense that normal consciousness would take it as an object. But there is still consciousness. So, and subsequently, the person reflects on the experience. And of course, they'll interpret it according to whatever their background is. You know, if, if Christian mystics interpret it as having the self, the soul having dissolved into a union with God. You know. So depending on, depending on what conceptual formations the mind has in it after the fact, 
it will be interpreted based on those. Object of consciousness, a lack? Because I thought that was what we always say. It, that the mind can't have. A, as its object, a lack. Isn't that what you said? Uh, well, that is. that it, it, we Yes, you can't take as an object an absence. What you can do is take as an object uh, the conceptualization or the formation corresponding to an absence. In what is called the seventh jhana, the formless jhana, this is called the base of nothingness. And so the person's mind has become very, very still. Uh, they have let go of, uh, uh, of the sense of spatial location and experience infinite space. They have experienced infinite consciousness, and then they have the experience of nothingness, of no thingness. But this is exactly what happens in your mind. Have you ever been, okay, you're, you're, you're looking for something and you thought it was in the drawer, and you open the drawer, and you're struck by, it's not there. But that is a mental formation. The nothingness is that absence. So you're not knowing the absence directly, but you're having experience of the formation of the absence. So is that what the direct perception of emptiness is? Is the perception of that mental formation and not the thing itself? And the direct perception of emptiness is What it is, is it's not of a mental formation corresponding to the absence of something. It is a direct understanding or a direct experience of the reality of ultimate truth that is revealed when there is no, when there is no projection, including the projection of nothingness. And there's a, when the mind is not even projecting nothingness, but rather what is revealed is not, because emptiness is defined as an absence, but it is not a negative. It is, emptiness is what everything is made out of. Emptiness is uh, the only thing that is, and there is something that is. What do you mean that it's not a negative? What do I mean that it's not a negative? Because a negative as in something that doesn't exist, it's missing, it's not there only exists as one, uh, only has meaning as one half of the duality of, of something, of existence or non-existence. Emptiness and nirvana, all these different terms that we use for the same thing, are describing something that is beyond either existence or non-existence. Those, you see, okay, we have to bring this back. I don't, I don't know, there will be a limit to how much that I can say about this, but if I can satisfy your intellectual need here, that's what I'm after, okay? All right, we have, on the one hand, we have things that we would say exist. In other words, they, 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 are, they are outside of the mind, and we infer that they have an existence outside of the mind. So, you know, you infer that the back of my hand exists even though you can't see it. You infer that the palm of my hand exists even though you can't see it. So that, that's what we mean by existence. Okay? And then there is another kind of real, which is that which we 
are experiencing, which is a projection of the mind. Okay? So the back of my hand is an existent that you infer. The palm of my hand is a mental projection that you regard as a real. Okay? And both of these have their opposites. Uh, you know, the, the existence that you infer of the back of my hand is not a real. So you have the real and the not real. Um, the existence, uh, you know, I could say that, uh, um, i turn my hand around. I could say on this side of my hand, um, I have a, a picture of the Buddha. And you would say, well, I just saw the palm of his hand a minute ago. There's no picture of the Buddha there, so I don't believe there's a, an existent there. So we have, in our normal reality, we have these two categories of things that we either believe in or don't. Existence and non-existence that are by inference, and the reals that are the objects of our direct experience in the moment. Emptiness is the removal of both of those. Emptiness is not something that's known by inference. So the back of the hand doesn't count. But there is no mind projection of a real. And so what is known, what becomes known to the mind, what becomes realized, and what changes the way the mind works in the future, is the experience that the reals are empty. Okay. Emptiness is the ultimate truth. In terms of con uh, uh, relative reality, emptiness is the fact that nothing actually exists the way it appears to us to. All of our reals are false. And so from the point of relative reality, that's what emptiness means. From the point of view of ultimate reality, emptiness is the ultimate reality. So it's it's no it's not a negation and it's not one half of an is and is not kind of or exists and does not exist kind of equation. Not a lack. From the point of view of relative reality, it's a lack. But in the the nature of emptiness itself is not a, a lack. And I realized that you probably have been training a lot of Pasangika Dhamma, which always reaches this point of uh, emptiness is empty too, and therefore uh, nothing exists. But, uh, and that remains true as long as you're talking from the point of view of appearances. The emptiness of things from the point of view of relative reality is also empty. Because the emptiness of things from the point of view of relative reality is itself another kind of formation. And that's why I prefer, of all the Madhyamakas, I prefer the Shentan Madhyamaka, which simply recognizes that. It says that once you, have, once you understand the Prasangika view, then you're left with the contradiction that, well, either there is nothing, which makes no logical sense at all, or else uh, non-existence doesn't exist either, which is another that makes no sense at all. So the Shentong view says that emptiness is the ultimate reality, and it's it's not it, it has the nature it has. It's the one thing that does have self-nature. Has the self-nature being empty? This is uh, that I, I I hope I hope that helped you a little bit. But 
when you get to that level of philosophy, it really is philosophy and it's logic. Better, better to better to focus on the more practical aspect and uh, get there yourself.